I don't know if you're here for the first hour, but what a treat we had with Dr. Mortensen and working through the whole subject of dinosaurs and the Bible and how it all works out. Let me just give you a little confession and then um, we're going to have Dr. Mortensen come up. I'll, I'll tell you, when I grew up um, a number of years ago in church, first, my church denied that dinosaurs even existed. And, and that was their way to discredit evolution. And I'll tell you another thing about my early church upbringing is they even used the Bible to support theories of racism. And is that one thing I'm really thankful for the ministry of Answers in Genesis is they, they brought scripture back to a prominent place. They showed that we are all one creation under God and he has made us all one race. There's one race, it's the human race, amen? amen? And you know, this is a special thing, and I'm so glad for the ministry of AIG bringing back a biblical perspective after it was distorted for so long. Well, we are in for another treat, and we're gonna bring up Dr. Mortensen in just a moment. He's been 21 years with Answers in Genesis, and uh, 26 years before that with uh, Campus Crusade, and this guy has a heartbeat for the Bible. He has a heartbeat for the gospel. He has a heartbeat for the next generation. That's why we've asked him to come. Because we realize that the next generation has been pounded through literature, through TV programs, through the educational system. You can't trust the Bible. You just can't. The scientists all say otherwise. And we're grateful for the ministry of AIG today, Dr. Mortensen, to help us realize we can trust the Bible because we can trust the God of the Bible is where it's at. So Dr. Mortensen, my brother, come on up and minister to us. We are excited about this. Know that tonight he is back on for two more sessions and then tomorrow night for two more sessions with us. And there's no Monday night football right now. So there are no conflicts on your schedule. I just checked. So make sure you come back for both of those after this time together, there are resources out there. One of the best resources that's going to be in the foyer is Dr. Mortensen himself. So if you have questions, hang on to them. We're just not going to be able to answer them in this forum, but hang on to them. And after the service, you're on, brother. Okay. God bless you. I'll come up Thank when you're you. done. All right. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. And uh, as Pastor said, I do work for Answers in Genesis. And... Uh, Answers in Genesis has a number of full-time speakers, but we also have our uh, Creation Museum in Northern Kentucky. How many of you have been to the Creation Museum? Okay, uh, the rest of you need to repent in sackcloth and ashes. <laughs> you need to come to this world-class museum. Um, we've had millions of visitors from all over the world. We're on 70,000 uh, 70, square foot museum and 50 beautiful acres with uh, walking trails and a, a lake. We've got five bridges over waterfalls. We've got a petting zoo, uh, a place for the little kids to burn some energy after they're tired from watching mom and dad look at the museum. And the teenagers can uh, go on our 16 course uh, zip line through the forest. Inside, we've got a 4D theater. We've got an amazing planetarium that we just upgraded to the state of the art. Uh, you can see 1% of Noah's Ark built to scale, and you can actually go inside. Our flood geology room is the largest room dealing with the whole question of Noah's flood and the age of the earth and geology. Uh, <clears throat> in the main hall, we've got animatronic uh, people and dinosaurs. We have an Allosaurus fossil uh, that was found out west. 97% of the skull, 50% of the skeleton professionally prepared for us. We also have life-size dinosaurs and an amazing exhibit on human origins where you'll learn how the evolutionists are using art to deceive us, to think that we evolved from some ape-like creature. I'm going to talk about that uh, tonight in the second session, so I hope you come back. We also have an amazing insect collection from all over the world, a bookstore that looks like a medieval castle, and uh, we talk about this creation evolution issue in the context of what's going on in our culture. 
And uh, in the museum, we present the gospel. We don't force anybody to uh, watch it or listen to it, but it's there clearly because we are not interested in people just believing in a creator. We want them to know the creator uh, through Jesus Christ. And Christmas is a great time to visit as well when we have uh, several hundred thousand lights and live nativity scenes. Also, I wanna let you know that we're very committed to education, and so um, we have high school labs for uh, homeschool kids to be able to get their lab experience with some of our scientists, and uh, so we've got labs scheduled through the year. You won't wanna drive down every few weeks for that, but we also have intensive labs in biology and chemistry for a week in the summer, so check that out. We also have explore days, um, when uh, kids can get hands-on experience with science and an explore camp in the summer for five days. And then in 2016, we opened our Ark Encounter, uh, which is about 45 minutes from the museum. So if you come down, plan on two full days, one day for the museum, one day for the Ark, you still won't see everything, but um, the Ark is built almost completely out of wood. Uh, three decks, just like the Bible says. We have 132 bays with exhibits, and uh, we have an animatronic Noah, and we show how they could, eight people could care for those animals, how they could get fresh water, fresh air, and the really important question, what did they do with all the manure? And we answer that, and it doesn't take rocket science. We answer questions about how many animals were on the ark and how could uh, all the, the, the animals that were on the ark, how could they produce all the species that we have today? We talk about the ice age. We have things for kids of all ages to learn and we have a petting zoo out there where you can see unusual animals, pet some, ride some. And then we've got a big playground for the little kids to burn energy and uh, an amazing zip line for the older kids. We also have a virtual reality experience uh, related to the flood. And we have uh, next to the Ark a huge auditorium, the Answer Center. Uh, we just had a women's conference for 2,000 women and uh, already for next year's conference in March, 900 women have already signed up. So uh, a great, great opportunity. This October we're having an Answers for Pastors, which isn't just for pastors. Um, a great conference on culture and church in crisis. The next weekend we have Dia Latino. If you have Spanish speaking friends who don't speak English well enough, they can come down on that day and there are bilingual people scattered through the museum and the ark who will uh, explain the exhibits. We also have a Creation College uh, Expo at the ark and uh, we have Christian colleges and universities that come in for that weekend and uh, an opportunity for high school seniors and their parents to talk to those colleges. Those are all colleges or universities that believe Genesis, just like Answers in Genesis does. We also have daily lectures at the museum and the ark, and um, those programs uh, on hands and the lab experiments. And you can even do an overnight, so if you want to bring your youth group down, uh, you can do an overnight at the ark and have an amazing experience. Well, <clears throat> this morning we want to talk about evolution versus uh, creation, does it matter? I've had the privilege of speaking in 35 countries on this subject, and I have found that most Christians don't think it matters. Uh, I found that either what they say or what they don't say implies that they believe that as long as you believe that God created and you believe in Jesus, it doesn't really matter when God created, how God created, how long he took to create. Don't worry about that. Uh, let the scientists worry about that. Well, I think there's um, uh, problems with that thinking and I wanna share some reasons today. Uh, but in the course of my travels, I've come to appreciate the uniqueness of America. This is a very unusual country in lots of ways. But one way America is really unique is that America is the country with the greatest number of churches, seminaries, Christian colleges, Christian radio and television, bookstores, resources, books, DVDs, magazines, music, movies, concerts, camps. There's no country that is a close second place. But if you've been paying attention to this country over the last few decades, and especially the last few years, you'll realize that America is becoming less Christian every day. 
it's becoming increasingly anti-Christian. Why is that? And why are we facing a, a moral crisis that even many non-Christians are concerned about? Millions of pages of pornography on the internet destroying lives. We've murdered 60 million babies in America since Roe versus Wade. The divorce rate has skyrocketed outside the church, but even inside the church. The Supreme Court has felt that they had the authority to redefine marriage. They don't really, but we have boys that are insisting on being in the girls' uh, sports teams and going into the girls' locker rooms. Uh, suicides are up. We can't have the Ten Commandments in public buildings. We can't have the prayer, prayer in Jesus' name in public schools, although we're starting to have Muslim prayers taught in public schools. So what's, what's going on in this country? And it's not just out there in the secular culture. We've got problems in the church. Back in 2009, uh, we asked America's research group to uh, do a national survey for us. They called around the country to, uh, to uh, 20,000 people to find 1,000 people to fit this description. They were between the ages of 20 and 29. They grew up in conservative Christian homes and churches, and they rarely or never go to church. And we wanted to know why. And we published the results of that survey in the book, Already Gone, which had the subtitle, Why Your Kids Will Quit Church and What You Can Do to Stop It. We found out a lot of things in that, in that uh, survey that we expected, but there were some surprises. One question we asked was, well, when did they first start to have doubts about the Bible? And uh, we thought the problem really started in college because the university is a very hostile place for the Christian today. But we were surprised. Uh, most of them said they started to have doubts in high school, middle school, even in grade school. They were getting questions that were causing them to doubt the Bible, and they weren't getting answers. They weren't getting answers at home, they weren't getting answers in Sunday school or youth group, and they weren't getting answers from the pulpit. And those questions were working like acid on their minds and their hearts. Well, we asked them what influenced them the most to doubt the Bible. And 45% said, it's the teaching of evolution in millions of years. I can't believe the first few chapters of the Bible, that's mythology. And the others who didn't give that as their first answer were influenced by those ideas. Well, that was 2009. In 2015, we asked America's research group to do another survey, this time to survey 20 to 29 year olds who grew up in the church who are still in the church. And we published the results of that in our book, Ready to Return. And we found some very disturbing things. We asked them, should abortion be legal? And these 20-year-olds in the church said, 52% uh, said, yes, or I'm not sure. Is homosexual behavior sin? 44% said, uh, no, or I'm not sure. Does the Bible contain errors? 39% said, yes, or I'm not sure. And why do you think the Bible contains errors? 52% said, the teaching of evolution in millions of years. So what do all these things have to do, do with each other? The growing moral crisis, the anti-Christian attitudes in our culture, the mass exodus of young people from the church. Well, Psalm 11.3 says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Foundations are very, very important. Here you have a really nice house. It has square uh, doors, square windows, carpet, curtains, wallpaper, good roof over the top, doesn't leak when it rains. But there's one thing about that house you don't see, and that is the foundation. And if the foundation has cracks in it, if the foundation has termites, it's only a matter of time. It might take years, it might take decades, but sooner or later, that house will look like that. Because the superstructure cannot stand if the foundation is not secure. Now we don't live in our foundation, but we better pay attention to our foundation. And I want to submit to you this morning that the book of Genesis is foundational to the whole rest of the Bible. In fact, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are foundational to every other doctrine in the Bible. They are built either directly or indirectly on the foundational truths of Genesis 1 to 11. And what we have seen happen over the last 200 years, as first the idea of millions of years was developed, 
in the uh, early 19th century by deists and atheist geologists, and I'm going to talk about that tomorrow night. And then Darwin came along with his theory of biological evolution, and then the Big Bang Theory in the 20th century. The more over the last 200 years that the church has either ignored those ideas, not even taught Genesis, or tried to harmonize those ideas with the Bible, the more over the last 200 years that the church has ignored or rejected Genesis, and most churches in all the countries I've been in have. The more the church has done that, the more we have seen over the last 200 years, the church and the culture reject other doctrines as well. I could give a lot of examples of the foundational importance of Genesis. Take the doctrine of sin. We're all sinners. But where was the first sin? Genesis chapter 3. And what is sin? Well, sin is failing to live up to the national average of morality in America. No, that's not. Well, that is sin because the national average is so low. But that's not the biblical definition. The biblical definition is sin is rebellion against the Creator. Sin is lawlessness. And everybody in this room and everybody who's ever lived on this planet is a rebel because we're descended from the first rebel, Adam. I assume that many of you, maybe most of you, are saved, forgiven rebels. But we're still all rebels. Or consider the seven-day week. You know, you can determine the length of a day, a month, and a year by the movement of the heavenly bodies. But there's nothing up there that will tell you how long a week is. So where'd that come from? It comes from the fact that God created in six days and rested on the seventh. Nations. Uh, when I speak at the museum or the ark, we have people from all over the world that come and I look out at the audience and I see that there are people with very dark brown skin, people with medium brown skin, people with light brown skin. And I, I don't know, but I suspect that many of them don't speak English as their mother tongue. They might speak Spanish or German or Russian or Japanese. How do we explain all that diversity of shade of brown skin color and all those different languages if we're all descended from Adam and Eve? The Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. That's where the languages came from when God supernaturally confused the language of the people that came off the ark and, and worked in Babel. And when we add our modern understanding of genetics to that historical event, it's easy to explain the different shades of brown skin color in the human race and other superficial differences in the slant of the forehead, the, the uh, sharpness of the cheekbones, these superficial differences. As Pastor said, there's only one race, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, tonight. The first coming of Christ is prophesied in Genesis 3. The second coming is prophesied indirectly through the events of Noah's flood, Genesis 6 to 8. Or consider marriage, sex, and gender. You know, we live in a culture today, uh, in a world really, where a very small but politically powerful minority says, who says marriage is a man and a woman? Why can't it be a man and a man? Or a woman and a woman? Or three women? Or a man and three women? And of course, in our last presidential election, uh, we had a, a open homosexual running for president. We have uh, pastors in churches that are transgender or homosexual or lesbian performing homosexual weddings. We have uh, drag queens going into public schools or public libraries in major cities of America reading uh, in the story hour for two to five-year-olds books that affirm that homosexuality, transgenderism, bigenderism, these are all normal. Uh, and of course, we have boys that are winning state girls athletic championships and wanting to go into the girls' locker room. Are those things right? Are those things wrong? Why? Well, Jesus once was asked a question about divorce. The Pharisees said, Moses permitted us to divorce our wives. What do you say, Jesus? And uh, Matthew records his answer. He said to them, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? He's referring to Genesis 1. 
And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He's quoting Genesis 2. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So Jesus said, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. But if you want to know God's perspective on marriage, you need to go back to the foundation of marriage. And he took them back to the book of Genesis. And there Jesus affirmed two important truths for our cultural context. The first is there are only two genders, male and female. And they are the creation of God. They're not a personal choice of any individual because they're determined by the DNA. The moment that the sperm and the egg, uh, the, the egg is fertilized before mom even knows she's pregnant, she has a boy or a girl. And you can't change your gender. You can cut off body parts, change your clothes, change your hair, take hormones, but you can't change your gender because it's coded in the DNA. And people who try, we need to have compassion for them. They're confused and they need our help and our love, not, not our condemnation. But people who try, sooner or later, they suffer very negative consequences. And studies show that transgender people are 20 times more likely to attempt suicide than the general public. So the second thing Jesus affirmed is that marriage is also the creation of God. It is one man and one woman for life. And uh, this passage uh, implies, and later passages clearly teach, that sexual relations are only for within marriage, and therefore adultery and fornication and pornography, as well as homosexuality, transgenderism, bigenderism, they're all wrong because they're contrary to God's created order and his commands. And listen, folks, God created the world the way he did, and he gave us his commands for our good, for our blessing, for our flourishing. And when we go against God's creator, created order and his commands, sooner or later we're going to suffer negative consequences. So Genesis is foundational to the doctrine of death, uh, excuse me, the doctrine of marriage, sex, and gender. And the more over the last 200 years, but especially over the last several decades, that the church has ignored Genesis or tried to reinterpret Genesis to fit with evolution in millions of years, the more we have seen the church uh, rejecting what the Bible says about marriage, sex, and gender. Because the New Testament teaching on these subjects is grounded in the truths of Genesis. And if Genesis 1 to 11 is mythology, if there never was an Adam and Eve, if that's all make-believe, then the foundation for the New Testament's teaching is demolished. But I want to focus in my remaining minutes on a few other doctrines I've found that most Christians, including most seminary professors and Christian college professors, have not thought about, which is why most of our Christian scholars have accepted the millions of years, if not also evolution. And one of those is the doctrine of death. We're all going to die someday, and we don't know when that will be. For somebody, it could be today. A car accident, a heart attack, a crime. But the question is, why is there death? Why do little babies die? And why do we have what we call tragic death, natural disasters like the 280,000 that died in the earthquake in Haiti or the several tens of thousands that died in the tsunami in uh, Japan or the several hundred that die every year in hurricanes and tornadoes or the thousands that died from the coronavirus or the Spanish flu or the Black Plague. And then when we look beyond human uh, existence, we see animals that rip other creatures apart. We go down below the rocks, uh, the, the surface of the earth, and we find fossils, which are dead things. And all over the earth, on every continent, and under this church, if you go down below the dirt, and under our Creation Museum, if you go down below the dirt, on every continent, there are thousands of feet of sedimentary rocks containing billions and billions of former living things. We're living on a massive graveyard. Why is it there? Did God make the world that way? And when we look at that fossil record, we don't just see evidence of, of uh, death. We see evidence of pain. We can see evidence in some of the fossils that the creatures were actually buried alive. 
we see evidence of killing. There are creatures fossilized in the stomachs of other creatures. We see evidence of thorns and disease and extinction. And for the last 200 years, the scientific majority has been telling the world it's an absolute proven scientific fact. Two plus two is four, and those rock layers are millions of years old. But if we're going to believe what the Bible says about death, we must reject that idea. Because the evolutionary view of death and the biblical view of death are diametrically opposed to each other. You see, in the evolutionary view, you have millions of years of death and disease and suffering, uh, creatures ripping other creatures apart, asteroids slamming into the earth, wiping out all the dinosaurs, supposedly 65 million years ago. It's nature red in tooth and claw. It's the survival of the fittest, which means that billions of unfit didn't survive. And it's that process, according to evolutionists, that led to man's existence. But the Bible says exactly the opposite. It says man was created in a perfect world where there was no death, disease, suffering, no natural disasters. Man sinned against God, and that brought the judgment of God on the whole creation. So in evolution, you have death before man. In the Bible, you have man before death. You cannot believe both of those ideas at the same time. One of those views is right, and the other one is wrong. And I believe what God said, and look at what he said. On day six, when he created Adam and Eve, then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. So man was originally vegetarian. He wasn't supposed to eat the animals, eat the plants. In fact, God did not give permission to eat meat until after Noah's flood. Genesis 9.3, God said, as I gave you the green plant, now I give you all things. So if you were planning on chicken for lunch, it's perfectly fine. We're living after the flood. But the next verse says, and every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky and everything that moves on the earth, which has life, I've given every green plant for food, and it was so. So the animals were also originally vegetarian. And notice the emphasis of the verse. And to every beast, and to every bird, and to everything that moves, not to some. So originally, the alligator, the eagle, the lion, the Tyrannosaurus rex, they were all originally vegetarian. And God tells us what he thinks about his creation in the very next verse. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. But it didn't stay very good for very long because God gave Adam and Eve a test and they failed the test. And we read about the consequences of that fall and sin in Genesis chapter three. And we need to pay careful attention to what it, the Bible says because there are Christian scholars, scientists, and theologians who are telling the church the only thing that happened in Genesis three was that man died spiritually. Well, Adam and Eve did die spiritually. Uh, they hid themselves from God. Their, their relationship with God was broken. But Adam and Eve weren't the first creatures that God judged. He judged the serpent. He judged the animals. And he said, cursed are you. And then in Eve was judged physically with increased pain in childbirth. Adam and Eve were judged physically with the death process beginning, that's in verse 19, and we know that's physical death because God said, from dust you came and to dust you shall return. The ground was cursed, and it's implied in verse 21 that God killed the first animals to make coats of skin to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. Now we know today that most viruses and bacteria are helpful. They, uh, they're, some of them are in your gut right now, taking care of your breakfast for you. But now, because of the fall of Adam, we have nasty viruses, nasty bacteria. In verse 18, God said, both thorns and thistles, it, the ground, shall grow for you. So if God cursed the earth with thorns after Adam's sin, we've got a big problem if we accept the millions of years. Because the evolutionists tell us there are fossil thorns in rock layers, and there are. 
They say those rock layers and fossils are three to 400 million years old. If those fossils are really that old, then God lied. Thorns and thistles didn't come into the creation after Adam sinned. They were already in the creation for hundreds of millions of years. But if God is telling the truth, and I believe he is, then this one biblical truth is reason to reject the millions of years. There's lots of other reasons, and I'm going to talk about those tomorrow night when we talk about geology, so I encourage you to come back. But we've got another problem if we accept millions of years, and that is that scientists have found in dinosaur bones evidence of brain tumors, arthritis, cancer. But according to the evolutionists, those creatures lived millions of years before man. So if that's really true, then there was brain tumors, arthritis, cancer in the creation before Adam in a time period that God called very good, which then means God called all those diseases very good. But what kind of a God would call those very good? I don't know any humans who think they're good. And then we come to the New Testament. And uh, in Romans 8, Paul says, we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. So we don't live in that original very good creation. We live in a fallen creation, a broken creation. Oh, it still bears the evidence of God's creative handiwork and the amazing plants and animals and the complexity of the DNA molecule and every living thing. But we live in a cursed world. So the battle over the age of the earth is not just a battle over time, it's a battle over what happened in the past history. It's a conflict of two histories of death. In the biblical view, no, th no death at the beginning, no death at the end when Jesus comes. Sandwiched between those, we have death and disease and suffering, and the Bible calls death an enemy. It's a temporary part of history. But in the evolutionary view, as long as there's been death, as there's been life. As long as there's been life, there's been death. As long as there will be life, there will be death. It's normal, it's natural. So why do you cry when your dog dies? Why do you cry when your grandmother dies? Why do you cry when your child dies? Or your spouse? It's normal, it's natural. And yet everything in our soul says, it's not right. It shouldn't be that way. And we cry. Two different histories of death. In the church today, there are a lot of different views on Genesis. Theistic evolution, progressive creation, the framework hypothesis, the gap theory, and there are many other views I could talk about, each one of those. They all have different ways of interpreting Genesis, particularly Genesis 1, but they all have one thing in common. They all accept the millions of years of death and disease and suffering and extinction. And there are many biblical and scientific reasons uh, to reject all of these views. I'm going to be talking more about those um, this evening and tomorrow. But a major reason why we must reject those views is because if we don't, we have to undermine what the Bible says about the original creation, what it says about the fallen, cursed creation, and what it says about the future redemptive work of Christ. So Genesis is foundational to the doctrine of death. And the more over the last 200 years that the church has either ignored or rejected Genesis and just said, well, the, the age of the earth, the evolution, that doesn't matter, don't worry about that. The more the church has done that, the more we've had a very difficult time answering the number one skeptical question. It's a question you've probably all heard. Maybe you've had this question. Maybe you know somebody who's struggling with it right now. And the question is this. If there's a loving, all-powerful, good God, why is there death and suffering in the world? Have you ever heard that question? That's a great question. And if we don't believe Genesis, we don't have a good answer. We might say, well, God is loving, all-powerful, and good, and I, I guess he made the world this way to test our faith and build our character. Well, he will do that if we, if we trust and obey him. But that's not a satisfying answer. Not to a skeptic, and not to me either. Because what kind of a God would make a world like this? I submit to you the correct answer is, he didn't make a world like this. This is not the world God made. 
This is the world God made and cursed. It's a fallen world, it's a broken world, not because God is a lousy creator or doesn't care, but because God is holy and man sinned and God judged. So if we don't believe Genesis, we don't have a good answer on that question. And that leads right on to the gospel. Genesis is foundational to the gospel and the very first promise of the Messiah is right there in Genesis 3. It's a very obscure promise. It doesn't tell us very much. But then as we go through the rest of the Old Testament, uh, we have more prophecies about that coming Messiah. Most of them already fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus of Nazareth. And then we come to the New Testament. And in a chapter on the resurrection, Paul says that Adam was the first Adam and Jesus is the last Adam. And he says, uh, "For for in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So Paul sees a very, very tight connection between what uh, Jesus did and what Adam did. And we have a question we've been asking Christians all over the world, wherever we speak on this issue. And the question is this, which Adam is not essential to the gospel? Well, you can't have the gospel without the last Adam. You have to have Jesus, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, did the miracles to prove that he was the unique son of God, died on the cross, a substitutionary death, to pay the penalty for your sin, for my sin, and the sin of the whole world, so that anyone who would repent, who would acknowledge their sin, acknowledge that they have rebelled against God, and that there's nothing they can do to save themselves, but humble themselves and put their trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that person would be forgiven and restored to a right relationship with God. Then Jesus was laid in the tomb. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Forty days later, he ascended into heaven, and he's waiting until the Father sends him back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the judge of all the earth. You have to have the last Adam for the gospel. But I submit to you, we can't have the gospel without the first Adam. Because if Adam wasn't a real man in a real garden with a real tree and a real wife who had a real conversation with a real serpent, and I don't know why we have trouble believing this, we have talking parrots today and there's nothing miraculous about it. A few years ago I was in Bolivia speaking and I met a pastor who showed me on his cell phone a YouTube video of his two pet parrots singing Spanish worship songs. It was hilarious. I don't know Spanish, but I could hear very clearly, Señor! I mean, they could even roll their R's. It was ridiculous. My son is a missionary in Honduras. He said, Dad, we sing that song in our church in Honduras. Now, they were obviously just mimicking, but the Bible says that serpent was empowered by a supernatural being called Satan, just like a donkey was empowered by the supernatural God to speak to the prophet Balaam in the book of Numbers. And if you say, well now, wait a minute, you know, I'm university educated, this is the 21st century, I I don't know about those talking animal parts in the Bible. Listen, folks, if you don't believe those, you don't have a logically consistent basis to believe any miracle in the Bible. Because it doesn't take any more faith to believe that a supernatural being can make an animal talk as that He can part the Red Sea, cause a virgin birth, make a man rise from the dead. You see, the Bible is not about the the man upstairs. It's about the almighty creator of heaven and earth. And he says that there is a being who is not equal to him, but is more powerful than you or I or all of us together. His name is Satan. And the Bible says he is the deceiver of the nations. And he is still alive and well on planet earth and he is still deceiving the nations. And he might be deceiving somebody in this room today to think, oh, this stuff is all fairy tales. I don't know about this. Think carefully about what you're hearing. If Adam, if if that whole account in Genesis is mythology, then Jesus died for a mythological problem and he is a mythological savior offering us a mythological hope. And the non-Christian world understands this better than a lot of Christians. Listen to this atheist writing in the American Atheist magazine. Christianity has fought, still fights, and will fight science 
Well, come tonight and you'll see evolution is not science. To the desperate end over evolution, because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reasons Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve, and that's what evolution does in the minds of people, and the original sin, and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. Take away the meaning of his death. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. And millions, hundreds of millions of people in this country and around the world haven't even been willing to listen to the gospel, much less believe it, because they have been brainwashed into thinking that science has proven this book is based on mythology. But it's really evolution and millions of years that are the myth, and I hope you'll come back tonight and I'll show you. The truth is, Jesus did die on a cross outside Jerusalem under the rule of Pontius Pilate. And on the third day, the tomb was empty. So Genesis is foundational to the gospel. Destroy Genesis in the minds of people, and you will see them rejecting or trying to reinterpret the gospel. Well, let's return to where we started. Genesis is foundational to morality. And the more you teach children and adults and congressmen and presidents and Supreme Court judges and, and uh heads of Hollywood and heads of corporate America and university professors, that they're just animals descended from some other animal which uh, descended from a little tiny bacterium that popped into existence by chance in the primordial oceans about three and a half billion years ago on an earth that formed by chance around a sun that formed by chance as a result of a big bang that happened by chance. And that's what's taught in every public school in America and in virtually every other public school in every country of the world and in all the science programs on television. The more you teach people that, the more they're going to reject Genesis. And the more they reject Genesis, the more they will reject biblical morality. And it makes perfect sense in an evolutionary view. Listen to the words of William Provine, a leading evolutionist in America. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. There's no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain that I'm going to be dead. That's the end for me. There's no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life, and no free will for humans either. Wow! Doesn't it excite you today? to know that there's absolutely no purpose or meaning to your life, and there's no right or wrong. If evolution is true, that's perfectly logical thinking. You see, if six creation days are in your past, that means that this book is true right from the very first verse. That means that God made you and me, and he makes the rules for our good, for our blessing, for our flourishing. But if millions of years are true, then this book is not true. It's written by pre-scientific, primitive, superstitious Jews and Christians. So man is the authority. You can just make your own rules. What's good for you is good for you. What's good for me is good for me, which is a great idea. Unless you're all black and you live in my town and I'm white and the mayor and a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Or you're Jewish and you live in my country, and my name is Adolf Hitler, then it matters what you believe. You see, there's really a worldview conflict going on. The naturalistic worldview that dominates science today, it's an atheistic worldview. On that foundation, you have moral relativism. It's just a matter of your opinion, what you think is right and wrong. But the Bible says there are moral absolutes that apply to every culture and every time. In a naturalistic worldview, who says marriage is a man and a woman? Why can't it be anything you want to define it to be? In an evolutionary view, uh, Facebook says there are 52 genders. The Bible says there are only two. And science confirms what the Bible says. In an evolutionary naturalistic worldview, we get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. We put our, put our dog to sleep when she develops severe diabetes and blindness. Put grandma to sleep if it costs too much money to keep her awake. No, the Bible says life is sacred because man is made in the image of God from the moment of conception till natural birth. 
God is the taker and giver of life. Two different foundations. But our, the biblical worldview does not dominate American culture today. And on that naturalistic foundation, you cannot sustain more Christian morality, biblical morality. And that's why it's collapsing. So we have all these issues going on in our culture. A lot of people think they're the problem, but they're not the problem. They're the symptom of the problem. The problem is at the foundational level of what we believe about where we came from. And over the last 200 years, the atheists and the deists have hijacked science, and they have been using evolutionary teaching to bombard the the founding chapters of Genesis. And during those 200 years, many Christian leaders have helped to destroy the foundation. I'm going to talk about that history tonight in the first session. I hope you come back. It's really important that we understand how we got into this mess. Many Christian leaders today are telling us we need to fight the moral issues. But the sad thing is many of those Christian leaders are also telling the church, don't worry about Genesis. Just help us build this crisis pregnancy centers. Let's just resist the homosexual agenda. But they say, don't don't worry about Genesis. At least don't worry about the age of the earth. But the battle is not just a battle of evolution versus creation. It's a battle of man's word against God's word. The words of scientists who were not there at the beginning, who were not there during the millions of years they talk about, as if they saw it all with their own eyes, who don't know everything, which is why they're scientists, who make mistakes, which is why they rewrite their textbooks every few years, and most of whom are like most people, they're still in rebellion against their creator trying to explain the world without God so they don't have to feel morally accountable to him. It's a battle of man's word against God's word. Who was there at the beginning, who was there all the way through history, who knows everything, who always tells the truth, who never has to rewrite his book. And he gave us the truth so that we would know the truth about him, the truth about us, what's right with us. We're all made in the image of God. What's wrong with us? We're all sinners in need of a savior and what God has done about that sin and will do. And we're bombarded not with uh, cannonballs but with ideas through the media, through books on dinosaurs, through the state and national parks, all the tour guides, the park rangers, the television programs, the natural history museums, the textbooks in the schools, all the secular universities are teaching it and most Christian universities are teaching kids to accept the millions of years. And so, we're increasingly finding kids growing up in Bible-believing homes and churches, but in those homes and churches, they're never given any answers. And so by the time they graduate from high school, they've been evolutionized. And their parents become evolutionized because the kids bring home what they've learned and instruct their parents, mom and dad, you, you went to school a long time ago. The foundations are being destroyed. So evolution in millions of years, does it really matter? Yes, those ideas destroy any basis for morality. They contradict the Bible's teaching on death. They make the gospel unbelievable. And they undermine the reliability and authority of the Bible. And what the Bible teaches and what real science confirms, and I'm going to show you some of that scientific evidence tonight and tomorrow night, And what our culture is increasingly revealing to us is that evolution in millions of years are destructive lies. And so we need to rebuild the foundations and uh, to help Christians believe this book right from the very first verse, to challenge non-Christians to rethink what they've heard all their lives in schools and science programs and consider more carefully the scientific evidence and what the Bible actually says and not what some churches say as pastors' church growing up, which was neither biblical nor scientific. But let me just say, this is a cartoon. We are not advocating shooting evolutionists. We love evolutionists. We want them to come to know the Savior just as we have. But Peter says we need to be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks us to give an an account for the hope that is in us. And so we've got a number of resources out there to help us have answers and defend our faith and help our children and our grandchildren 
and then to share with our unbelieving friends or work associates to answer their questions that they have. The lie by Ken Ham, our founder and CEO, uh, explains what I've talked about here, why the church cannot compromise with evolution in millions of years. A very easy book to read. And then we've got a special offer, five books to, to give you an instant uh, creation library. Uh, Divided Nation, Ken Ham's most powerful talk put into a book form and uh, you can actually download the slides that are in color in the book uh, to be able to use in Sunday school class or whatever, um, but explaining what's going on in our country and how our nation is divided and uh, how the foundation has been destroyed. He also has a book, Will They Stand, for, especially for parents. Will your kids stand in the midst of this growing hostility towards biblical Christianity? And how can you help them stand and be strong believers in the, in the next generation? Uh, Ken has also written a book, Creation to Babel. It's a commentary on the first 11 chapters. Not a technical commentary, but a, a family commentary that you can read in little bits around the kitchen table at supper time and uh, educate yourselves and your kids. Uh, the book, One Race, One Blood. Powerful book showing that both the Bible and science confirm there's only one race, but helping us understand how the differences in our physical appearance can be explained on the basis of the truth of Genesis and genetics. And then the Answers book, which answers the 27 most asked questions, like about dinosaurs, radiometric dating, distant starlight, uh, natural selection, so those are all, you can get those at a special price uh, of $70. Then we have answers books for the grade school kids. Each one answers 20 questions with a one-page answer. Uh, each book is on a different topics. We have quick answers for tough questions, about 12 questions with uh, just a couple pages answered. Uh, Glass House, which answers the 27, or refutes the 27 leading arguments that evolutionists present to the general public in favor of evolution in millions of years. We're being deceived by smoke and mirror arguments. And again, we've got books on dinosaurs for the little kids. And, uh, and then if you really want to dig into the, the, uh, the, the, the biblical text, this is a book that I edited and contributed to with 13 other scholars defending uh, Genesis in an in-depth way, biblically and historically. We don't get into the science. Then we have an Answers magazine that comes uh, four times a year, beautiful full-color magazine with a center section for the really little kids. And if you subscribe, you get the digital subscription free. And uh, you can get one DVD free for each year that you subscribe. And uh, the, they'll tell you about that at the uh, cash table where you can subscribe to the to the magazine. Great resource for building a biblical worldview, not just about creation. And then our free newsletter, which comes 12 times a year. You can sign up to that on the book tables and uh, lots on our website. So I encourage you to uh, take advantage of those resources and the conference coming up at the ARC and our Answers TV streaming service. I'll tell you more about that tonight and pick up a brochure. So that's why this issue matters. We're in a war, a war of ideas, truth against lies, and the gospel is at stake. The truth of God's word is at stake. And so I encourage you, I encourage you, if you've, if you've struggled with these ideas or you've even been resistant to what the Bible says in Genesis, I encourage you to think more carefully about this and examine some of the resources. God bless you, Pastor.